morning. You are with the Pension Benefit Design and Funding Task Force. It is December 1st. Welcome back. It's been a few weeks uh, since we met. Um, and uh, part of that delay was uh, intentional because we thought we wouldn't receive the full actuaries reports until mid-November. Um, it turns out that the last batch of them arrived yesterday. And so um, Chris Rupp, Joint Fiscal, looks like he got some sleep last night. So it must be he didn't have to burn the midnight oil in order to uh, create uh, a slide deck to help us unpack what the actuaries uh, brought back for information. So thank you, Chris, for making quick work of that. Um, First up on our agenda is to review last meeting. And I don't know if you all can remember what we did in our last meeting, but if anyone has uh, uh, any thoughts or observations or um, reflections on the last meeting, we'll uh, take a moment to do that now. I can't remember when it was. Exactly. Mm -hmm. About November 15th. I believe you were in a little Zoom box. Yeah. yeah. You and I were Zooming, I remember. It was the 10th. Yeah. It was so good. Was it? Oh, no, 17th or 10th. It was the 10th. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, Andrew. Uh, I was just glad that we had Graham Campbell come back to speak to us um, talking about revenue. Uh, in general, I find Graham's presentation is very clear and to the point and easy to understand. So it's good information to, again, kind of look at some of those factors we've been talking about for revenue. Um, and to get some more clarity, especially on the cannabis, and to get some of the information from the cannabis control board. I think that was really helpful to consider. Um, there are a lot of numbers to look at there and ones that have still been running through my mind. Anybody else? Molly? I'm just remembering that I think we talked a little bit about the um, hearings and we talked about the different ideas that people had presented and then I think you summarized something and I really appreciated that discussion just kind of going through the individual um, suggestions people had made that's what it was the suggestions that people at the hearings had made am I not talking on thank you I, I, I think, noticed that on the I think zoom you want to be I, um yeah you know within a few inches yeah thank you I noticed that on the zoom end so I appreciate the reminder um yeah, I just, I just remember really appreciating the <laughs> suggestions people had made in the discussions that we had around that. Yes, I forgot that we did that. Me too, until that moment. Yeah. Anyone else have any ob observations from November 10th? All right. Yes. yes. Uh, and pulling from my memory here because it has it has been a long time but um after what, what andrew had mentioned kind of brought something back for me and um i know we've wrestled with how we address the, the revenue piece whether we include some do it through some sort of appendix and um i, I you know i was wondering if we could revisit that topic at some point and if if i think the more specific we can be the better for our, our long-term work. And if there are certain elements that there is consensus around, I think it would behoove us to explore those and um, put our report in the best uh, place to be received by the, the legislature when you all begin your uh, next uh, session's work in earnest. So um, thank you. Uh, next up on the agenda is to talk about the timeline of our remaining meetings. Um, we, uh, we have a goal to wrap up our work um, by December 15th, which means that we um, have one meeting between now and then uh, to begin to work on um, the final recommendations and the final chapters of our report. Well, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, are we going to get that last part for the group F 
the corrections and all of that. The combined ones, could you? It's listed online and it's ready to take up the copyright. Uh, I think the owner is referring to request number five. Yeah, so uh, I think what what the holdup on that was that we need to be aware that we have a budget for actuarial services. And so when we finish our day today, um, we should know, or we should be able to uh, have a, a better sense of whether we are comfortably within our um, actuary budget and, and therefore would have the ability to request that analysis, um, or if we have blown through that budget, we you know we may need to reconsider or um, or or make other arrangements for having that conversation at a at a future date. We can't you know we can't spend more than the one hundred and fifty thousand dollars that we have in our budget for. Well, we're we're going to be working about the day to day to to figure out whether we need to refine any of the scenarios that we asked for back in October. Um, we, I always expected that we would, right? I, I didn't think that we would be hitting a home run on, on our first swing at it, but we may, we may need to go back and look at different combinations of scenarios. Um, but many of those um, possible actuarial asks are simply, you know, tweak this and run it again, as opposed to building a whole new uh, actuarial analysis. And so the, the things that we might ask for this afternoon could be um, easier and less expensive. So do you know how much we've spent so far? Um, Chris probably has that information. Sure. Uh, good morning, Chris, Joint Fiscal. Um, so as, uh, uh, Representative Copeland Hans has mentioned we have we are planning with an actuarial budget of about one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars for the work. We have been invoiced for around thirty to date for the first three requests. We have not been invoiced for this request for yet, but the cost estimate we received when we submitted it for from the actuaries was it would cost between fifty to sixty thousand dollars. So the work we've done to date, I'm, I'm working on the assumption that we've obligated 100,000 of the 150,000. So that means we have 50,000 remaining. Whenever we asked them, what we did with request five was we asked them to give us a, a time and, and cost estimate to see what would it cost to do that analysis. They estimated about $25,000 to do that analysis. Um, and, and being able to do that was sort of predicated on getting request four done first because one of the things we're asking them to look at in request five is applying one of the changes they modeled in request four to that universe of employees. So right now, you know, and, and this is, again, we have not gotten an invoice yet for, for request four, but if we're assuming we have 50,000 remaining, 25,000 of that 50 would be for request five, that would leave 25,000 remaining for follow-up actuarial work. So I think depending on the complexity of what you want to continue studying after this today, we can then submit another request to the actuaries and see, hey, what can we do within our remaining resources? So if we're making some tweaks to the model they've already built for us, it's probably not going to cost all $50,000, but without knowing the complexity of what all you want to look at in the follow-up, it's hard for us to know how much room we have left in our budget. So that's sort of where we are right now on that. I think once we have today's discussion done and we have a sense of what else people want to look at, we can send that over to them and see how much that's going to cost and then figure out how much room we have to navigate. Yeah, Molly. I just want to ask a question about that. I don't really have an opinion one way or another about that's whether that's the most important thing to send to the actuaries, but I'm just wondering about process. Is it something that we agreed to send? And if so, can we have a group decision-making process if we're going to make changes to an agreement? I, um, I don't I, honestly remember. I, I, don't, I don't think it was something that we uh, agreed to as a full group. It was a request that was made that we have said right along needed to, needed to be made when we know whether we have enough in our budget to do that. Okay, I, I honestly well, don't remember. We didn't. I didn't, I wasn't part of that, I mean, amongst you guys, 
I, 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 my understanding was that what we talked about was that that would be the the final. It couldn't be done anyway until twenty four or what that was called was, and that we are going to um, when Chris goes through the actuarial reports that we got, we are going to have to um, do some tweaking and ask for more reports. So if we if that's going to cost us forty thousand dollars to do that, we won't have the money left to to do the the fifth study. Um, I, I mean, it's it is as simple as that, I I believe. And the I'm just going to check the next step in time because I thought there was language in there around this proposal. So it, it did it did say um, look at the judiciary and corrections, mm -hmm. but it it didn't. Specify that we Are you comfortable. What? <laughs> I think Pat is Pat's unmuted. Unmuted. That's okay. Um, but <clears throat> I mean, I think that we should we should proceed here with our agenda, and then when we do go through the actuarial reports and figure out what it is that we need to have redone, then we can talk more about this because it doesn't make any, in my mind, it doesn't make any sense to talk about it now since we have no idea if we're gonna be able to do it or not. So does that make sense? Is the clock right? Is it a quarter to 10? No, no, it's no, nine fifteen. Okay, all right. I. The clocks in the house, I don't know if you know this or not, but are all different and they're different. It, I love it because you can leave the lounge at five minutes to one and get to the GovOps room at 20 minutes to one, or you can leave at five minutes to one and get there at a quarter after one. So you just never it know. Just, you just never know. And um, But I, I just wondered if that clock was right. So thank you. Um, but we do need to look at the timeline for our, the rest of our meetings. If we um, will spend the today looking at the actuarial reports and what we need to tweak and where we need to go. And then we have a meeting scheduled for the 8th, 9th, <laughs> and then the final one on the 15th. And we're going to have to come up with um, a report and recommendations on the 15th. Is that everybody's understanding? Peter? So one of the things, I know what Act 75 says, it says 15 December. However, this report is gonna to go to House GovOps and Madam Chair is the chair of House GovOps. So as long as we get this report in, in time for GovOps to begin to take action on it, fairly early in the session, we're fine. Yes. And, and and so so what I'm saying is I think we might need a we might need to be the, you know, I don't know how many more meetings we actually have in the in the bank that we can use. I know we have at least one. Um, and I don't know about others, but the week after Christmas week is probably a week we're gonna have to meet to be able to finalize this uh, this report unless we want to meet on Monday the, the of, uh, you know the first the, whatever the second or third of january which that would not be my preference <clears throat> no i i i can't do that yeah. so I, I would recommend that, that, but... we, that we schedule a meeting for the for the uh, last week of december to finalize the report i'm i'm fine with that i think that um so uh when <laughs> i guess I don't know where everybody else is on that. It will also give the action, just, I don't know when the actuaries, uh, the, the, if we do send something to them, how long it will take them to turn it around. Uh, you know, will give us a little bit of yep. uh, a little bit of time just in case they don't turn it around uh, as quickly as we might hope. Yeah, but, and whether it starts in the house or the house, be um, um, 
it won't be a bill until January 4th. That's I mean, right. it won't be introduced until That's January right. 4th. And the important yeah. thing here, this is the last thing I'll say for now, is that we do good work, not that we do fast work. Yes, agreed. Agreed. Anybody else? I mean, that's the week between Christmas and New Year's. And um, I don't know where everybody is on meeting that week, but uh, that is about the only week that we could do it. So I'm available every day. I will be in Chicago for my nephew's bar mitzvah. Okay. I can't do the 27th. I think we should well, see what we come up with during the meeting today. Yeah. Before we talk about scheduling. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Meeting. I think that that makes sense. Yep. And then we can also look at it under the agenda setting, agenda item. <laughs> okay. So do we want to, we're a little bit early, but do we want to, I think we have Ben and Pat with us. So let's shift gears. Yeah. I don't know. I see Pat, oh, there he is. Here. Yes, hi. Hi, Ben. Welcome. Hello. Thank so, you. So um, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. And, and I don't know how you want to do this, if, but the show is yours, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, for the record, I'm Pat McDonald, President of the Board of Directors of Campaign for Vermont. With me today is Ben Kinsley, who is also a board member and our resident policy wonk. Um, I just want to take a moment, if I can, to recognize uh, David Coates, former manager, partner of KPMG, who has helped us uh, with this review of the data that we're gonna to present today and to put the presentation together for you. He's, unfortunately, David wasn't able to join us today because he would have been an excellent addition. So I wanted to make a few introductory comments, summarize the finding of the reports that we sent you, and then turn it over to Ben to review in detail the charts that we provided. The report I'm referring to is entitled The Public Sector Reality. Campaign for Vermont um, released it on November 10th, and I'm hoping that you all have a copy so that uh, you can follow along. Um, over the past month, I'm sorry, you got it. Yep. Over the, okay, over the past months of all of your pension discussions, which I found fascinating, you are doing a very detailed, incredible job on a very complicated issue. Uh, we've heard claims about the state's non-competitive wages and um, not that that's not a new statement because when I was commissioner of personnel and in Department of Labor, we heard that back, back way back then. Um, but we decided to verify those statements. Um, and we set out expecting, I did particularly, to find the pension benefits were unquestionably an asset to recruiting and retaining our public sector workforce. And we all, we all said it. And no one ever um, stepped back and, and challenged that statement. I was former commissioner of the Department of Labor and twice commissioner of human resources. And I was particularly surprised at what we found in the, in the data. Um, there were obviously a number of assumptions that were carried through the years that were just plain wrong. I'm assuming at some point in history, they were true, which is how it all started, but no one ever questioned it till we started looking at these numbers. Um, because it's been a long-standing belief that the public employee wages were below the private sector. And over the years, no one challenged that assertion, particularly me. Um, it was clear in many instances that the exempt or, or appointed positions were below average for, for similar positions in the private sector. I remember the Business Roundtable did a report when I was Secretary of Transportation um, which showed that my salary, because I uh, was in charge of a thousand employees, was uh, sorely under um, the public, the private sector salaries that I would have gotten for that job. Um, and I think I think that 
that concept that I we knew that the exempt employees were um, below private sector, and I think we all just assumed that it trickled on down um, throughout the organization. Um, so the Vermont data that we have in the report comes from the Department of Labor, the Agency of Education, and other public sources. Um, and we came up with six key findings, which I'd like to read to you. And then Ben, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben, and he's gonna go over the charts that support each of these statements um, so that you know what the numbers are and um, where, why we can make these statements. So the first key finding is the average public sector employee is in the top 25% of income earners in Vermont, even before you consider health benefits, which is another discussion altogether. The second one was on average, employees make nearly $12,000 less in the private sector versus the public sector. The average, number three is the average private sector employee makes at least 20,000 less per year in retirement than a public sector employee. And this, this disparity likely grows when health benefits are considered once again. Wages for public sector employees have grown faster over the past 20 years than private sector employees. And over the past 30 years, as far back as we have data, uh, private sector wages have consistently lagged the public sector. The problem is going to get worse before it gets better. And we've heard this before, as nearly 20% of state workers are approaching retirement. And the last finding was the extraordinary benefits offered to public sector retirees may not be necessary to compete for qualified workers. I think that was um, the thing that we that we found most stark in um, in when we're looking at this data that going forward we may not need to be quite as generous as we thought we did to compete for the private sector. So I'd like to turn it over to Ben, um, who can go through the slides with you so that you can see the numbers and see why we made the statements we did. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Ben? Thanks, Pat. Um, my name is, for the record, my name is Ben Kinsley. Um, I'm the Board of Directors for Campaign for Vermont, um, one of the authors of the report. Um, and I'm going to walk through a couple of the charts, the key charts that are in there. Um, and, uh, and then happy to answer any questions that, that folks have. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, hopefully you'll be able to, to see some of the charts. I don't know how big your, uh, your screen is on that side, but hopefully you'll be able to see some of these. Oh, it's very big. Thank you. Um, Eric, did you? Um, <laughs> Mr. King, I was just curious, um, as you're going through the charts, if we have specific questions on a particular chart, do you, do you, do you mind a question in the moment or would you prefer us to hold those questions until after? Um, it's probably, uh, if you have a question in the moment, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to pause in between and allow for questions um, as we go. Cause I do think it's it's often easier to ask those as you're looking at it. So um, so I'll try to pause to give, to give uh, opportunity for that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Of course. Um, so the first thing that we looked at it was looking nationally at what these numbers look like. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has pretty good, pretty good data on <clears throat> what uh, you know private sector wages versus benefits look like, and they can break that down on an hourly basis to kind of account for part-time versus full-time employees. Um, and even uh, even here, we start seeing that um, there's a pretty big jump uh, between where state and local and. One thing I would point out here is these numbers include local, which are lower. Um, we can see that in our state level data from um, from the Department of Labor that you know local government salaries tend to be lower than state salaries, and then state salaries tend to be a little bit lower than federal salaries. So um, so there is a little bit of uh, um, if we pull the locals out of this data, it would probably be a little higher than it is. It's just that the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't doesn't do that for how they report this. Um, so the first thing that we see here is that uh, wages are definitely higher. You can see that in that um, third set of columns there. Uh, it's about uh, $8, well, um, $7.50 or so more um, per hour in, uh, in wages alone that uh, state and local governments um, are paying. 
And then the other really big uh, difference is gonna be in the retirement healthcare and insurance benefits. Um, those are two to three times um, what the, the private sector is offering. Um, again, this is national level data. Um, so kind of the next piece to this, we're like, okay, so this is what's going on nationally. This is kind of what the norm is. Um, and then uh, we started digging into some of the state level data. One of the first things that we found uh, was that for teachers specifically, um, you know, the Vermont's pretty, pretty close to the national average, almost right on the national average. Uh, we're also um, higher than some neighboring states like New Hampshire, um, our, our uh, teacher salaries are a little bit higher. Um, and again, this, uh, this data is actually from um, the, uh, uh, it was reported by Ed Week, but it's actually NEA data is where they pulled it from. Um, and one of the other side notes here that we discovered as we were kind of looking into this, um, like how, how competitive are our teacher salaries nationally. Um, we also found that our student teacher ratio is one of the lowest in the country. Um, it's not necessarily a new, a new finding, but a lot of the, the states that pay higher, for example, California, um, you know, is, is more like a 25 to one ratio, whereas Vermont's a, um, a ten, oh, basically a 10 or an 11 to one ratio. So um, there's a, a lot of those states that are, um, you know, paying higher salaries are also, uh, are also uh, um, have a lot more students in each classroom. So um, pause there in case there are any, any questions at this point. Uh, hi, I'm one, um, my name's Kate, and I'm wondering, does teacher data for other states include just certified teachers? Um, so uh, I believe it is looking at, um, I believe it is looking at just certified teachers. I'd have to go back and look at the data reporting standards um, for exactly how that's, that's being calculated. Those numbers come from the National Education um, uh, Data Archive, which is a federal government program. Um, so, so they're consistent reporting standards across all states. Uh, I believe it does only include qualified teachers though. And do you know if um, school nursing staff are included? Um, off the top of my head, I don't. I'd have to go back and look at the data standards um, for, for what they're reporting. On the chart there, it lists that Vermont is the 16th highest out of 21 states. Um, there's only 21 on there. Has the chart been truncated? Yeah, the, the chart is truncated. So we included the top, um, some of the top states and then some, um, for example, like that are similar to Vermont, like Hawaii, Wyoming, uh, New Hampshire. Um, so like California, Massachusetts are the top ones. Um, DC is right behind them. Um, and then so trying to show like what the range is a little bit. Cause it, when you put all like, 50 states on a chart like that, it starts getting hard to tell exactly what's going on. So it is truncated um, to, to show some of the, the highest paying states and then um, some ones that are sort of in the same ballpark as Vermont and then Mississippi is the lowest. So we put that on the chart as well. And I have a follow-up question. Has the chart been adjusted to reflect the cost of living in each state? Um, no, it is not. Uh, is not inflation adjusted or CPI adjusted. Um, so again, this is straight from, this is 2019 uh, data from um, the National Education Association. Oh, I think Peter has a question. Just a quick comment, thank you. Uh, so if you're looking at this electronically, at the bottom of this chart, you can click on the, uh, the live link and it brings you to the, a little bit down, it brings you to a, uh, estimated salary for all 50 states for 2018-2019. So it's got all of it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, if you're looking at the digital version, the link does go to the full the full chart and the, and the source, yep. Eric, you have a question? Oh, oh, my, oh. Um, um, yeah, it's, it, it actually, it dovetails very well with that. Um, so I did click through to the, that, that supporting link. Um, and, you know, you feel free to follow up with us after if you can't answer it now, but it's a little unclear to me where, I mean, I see the data, but it's the sourcing of the data is, is a little un, unclear to me. Um, it's referenced as uh, NEA, but I, if you could follow up more specifically with uh, the source um, data, I think it would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, I'll, we'll see if we can track that down. Um, 
that down for you. Thank you. Oh, John has an answer? Yes. Oh. If okay. you actually look at the document that Peter referenced, um, there is a link in it to the NEA research that was done. Okay. Now Molly has a question. Hi, my name is Molly Stoner. Um, I just wanted to point out, I know you were referencing one of your comments was about Vermont relative to New England states. And I just, for the record, want to point out New York, which is our, uh, you know, Western border and one of the competitors for teachers. And I want to point out the discrepancy in average salary between New York state teachers and Vermont teachers. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and something, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of other things we'd like to look at that we, we kind of came across in the report. Um, and one of them is to look at, uh, you know, New York is tricky because you have, you know, the city and the surrounding area kind of pulling up the average um, across the state. I mean, that happens in Vermont, too. You have, um, you know, uh, teachers uh, in the Northeast Kingdom that are making 45, eight, you know, 45, 48,000 a year compared to South Burlington that are making almost 80,000 a year. You know, we have some of that going on here too. So, you know, to compare Vermont to like New York City is probably not the best comparison. We really kind of need to compare it to upstate New York. And that was kind of outside the scope of what we were trying to do in this um, in this particular report. But I think that is worth looking at is, you know, what is, uh, how competitive are, you know, teacher teaching positions in Plattsburgh, for example, compared to Burlington and, and that sort of thing. You have another just a quick follow up anecdotally not uh, anything other than anecdotally but I do know that 12 years ago I was uh, vacationing with someone who happened to be a upstate New York teacher and at the time their top end salary in the Adirondacks was 25,000 higher than the top salary in the district where I work in Vermont just as an anecdotal point of reference. Yeah that's good to know um, yeah I think I think that would be worth looking at. Um, to, to kind of know what that what that is because again you know we're not we're not necessarily competing with New York City for workforce we're probably more likely competing with upstate New York so I think that's that is worth something worth looking at thank you I think we're questioned out on that one that's All right. oh, wait. I guess not uh, sorry I, I'm just exploring some of the links that are in the document there um, sure. I think it's from the Ed Week article where it talks specifically about regional cost of living differences and that there's a study in there um, that shows that the rankings change significantly when cost of living is taken into account. Um, just doing a quick look here, when you consider that, it looks like Vermont moves to 36 out of possibly 51 that are listed here, I believe it has District of Columbia. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, you can do that cost of, you know, for, for our purposes of comparing, um, you know, uh, comparing public sector, to, so public sector to private sector, the cost of living in Vermont presumably is going to be the same regardless of what type of employer you have. Um, so that is significant when you're looking at how you compete with other states, but that's not exactly what we were looking at here. We were looking at how, do, how is our public and private sector competitive with each other. And in that case, you know, cost of living is sort of, sort of irrelevant in that, for that question. Not that it's not an important question to ask, but for the purposes of comparing our public and private employers um, in the state and how competitive we are with each other, um, you know, it cost of living is sort of um, the same for both groups. That, 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 that may be, you know, your broader point, but in fact, the data on this chart uh, does compare other states. Um, so to not account for that critical information, um, you know, I think that's questionable at best. Sure. What? I mean, um, again, the cost of living piece of it was sort of, we weren't, we weren't trying to say how competitive, you know, Vermont is with other states. I think that is worth looking at. Um, it's really, you know, how are, how competitive are wages um, and then how, and how do the overall picture of wages and benefits compare between the public and private sector here in Vermont? Um, all right, so one of the, this is probably the, the chart that kind of lays it out the, the cleanest. Um, so what, what's going on here is we took uh, 
we added both the, the median and the 70, 75th percentile uh, metrics from the Department of Labor to, um, to as reference points to kind of understand like what the range is here. Because um, one of the things is, is when you start looking at salary ranges, particularly in the, um, in the private sector, there's a very large range uh, compared to what's happening with um, private sector employees. It's just a, a narrower salary band. Um, Pat got to that a little bit with, you know, some of the some of the research that came out um, in the late 2000s around, uh, you know, executive positions in state government being undercompensated compared to the private sector. Um, that's almost certainly true um, because they're, they're still the top income earners, but they're making less than, you know, an equivalent position in the private sector. Um, but the floor is also higher. So like the entry level salaries for, um, for the public sector is, uh, is higher than the entry level salary in the private sector. So, um, you know, it's just a, a narrower salary band when you start looking at that. Um, so so the, that's why the medians in the 75th percentile are in there to kind of under, help us understand where those, where those fall. Um, Private sector salaries, uh, you know, uh, forty eight thousand four hundred is the average. Um, the uh, we threw all workers in there, which includes uh, private um, and public, uh, just to kind of again give another data point for comparison purposes. Uh, the average um, state employee is, uh, and this is again twenty nineteen data, um, sixty thousand uh, five sixty five, and then average teacher salaries are right there as well. Um, at 60,200. And both of those numbers, interesting, you know, when you start looking at 75th percentile, um, both of those numbers are very close to being in the top, um, top 25% of income earners. So that was one of our, one of our most interesting takeaways off the bat when we started looking at the DOL data was that, um, you know, on average, uh, teachers and state employees are both making, you know, more than, uh, um, more than 75% of, uh, of other workers um, on average, which is, um, which is interesting. So um, I think that, and, and also $12,000 more per year on average in the private sector. Now there are some differences there with, uh, you know, um, uh, what we'll, we'll get into here in a second, but uh, any questions on this chart before we kind of dive into that? Hi. Sorry, me again. This is Molly. I, I just wondered if you had a juxtaposition we could look at with this chart that has to do with education required for different positions. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I do have, uh, we do have a slide that looks specifically at teachers because we, we recognize that there was um, going to be a difference in the education levels required for teachers as opposed to other types of workers. Um, when you start looking at state employees, it gets difficult because there's often not comparable positions, um, you know, comparable positions between state government and the private sector. Um, so that that starts getting difficult to compare. Um, that is a piece of piece of this that we'd like to dive into further as we work. You know, there's probably going to be a, a phase two to this project, um, and that's something we would like to look at a little bit in a little more detail. But but looking at the Department of Labor data. It's really kind of difficult to compare, um, you know, equivalent positions in the state government to the to the private sector. Just just to follow up, I'm sorry. I thought I heard you say yes. You had done that with teachers. Can you direct me to that part of yeah, the? Yeah, it's um. I think it's going to be slide six or seven. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, slide six. Yeah. And I have figure names. Do you know the figure name? Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, it's going to, yeah. Um, so we'll get to that here in a second. Um, yeah, so again, this is looking at 2019 data. So we, you know, looking at this, we're like, okay, well, um, you know, we were, um, you know, we, Pat and I both thought, and the other folks that were involved in helping putting this, putting this data together, it's like, uh, you know, that's not really, what our understanding was that, um, you know, that state employees and teachers are actually making more on average than the private sector. Um, so we decided to go back um, as far back as we could looking at the DOL data. DOL data goes all the way back to 1990. Um, so we didn't put all, you know, 
all 30 years on the chart here because it starts to um, dilute some of what is happening over the past decade or so. But um, that is, I think all that data is in the full report. Um, and uh, what we found was that uh, at no point um, in the last 30 years, as far back as we have data, have uh, um, private sector salaries exceeded the public sector salaries on average. Um, you know, there's, there are going to be individual positions, like we talked about, like executive level positions that are going to be underpaid in the, um, you know, in the public sector, even, uh, play things like, uh, like IT, for example, may be underpaid in the, um, in the public sector versus the private sector. Uh, so there are some like specific job categories that may be less competitive, but looking at the overall picture, um, you know, the, the overall picture is that, um, you know, the, our state, state uh, jobs pay pretty well in terms of wages. Because again, this is just wages. Both of those charts are just wages. We're not looking at benefits in either of them. Um, a couple things that we do notice here is that uh, over the, the past 20 years, um, you know, state employee wages have grown 5% faster than the underlying economy and have even outpaced industries like healthcare by 10%, which is interesting. Um, so, so there is, uh, you know, there are, there are even with some somewhat similar industries, um, pretty competitive uh, wage growth um, and the wage growth is outpacing the, the public sector. One thing to note here that is interesting and is probably worth sort of outside the scope maybe of what what this task force is looking at, but um, what would be interesting to understand is that since 2010, um, teacher salaries have uh, have started to um, come down a little bit or grow less fast. I shouldn't say they come down; they've started to the the growth the rate of growth has decreased for um, teacher salaries. That's likely because of um, of because of shrinking student populations or causing budgetary constraints. Um, so the budgets aren't growing as fast. That would be my assumption, but it's just kind of an interesting thing to note. We actually saw in 2019 is the first time in the, the data that's available where, um, uh, where state employees actually caught up to teachers for average salary. So um, interesting data point. I'm not sure how relevant that is for um, the work that you guys are doing, but um, but something that probably work that's probably worth looking into more at some point. Mr. Kingsley, um, I'm, 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 yeah, glad, I'm glad you uh, you highlighted the uh, difficulty of comparing uh, uh, across job groups. Uh, if you go into source one and you look at the uh, job codes, uh, there's an incredible amount of disparity between the number of jobs included in the private sector versus state government, federal government, and local government. I just be, I'd be curious um, as to how you defend statistically um, rolling all of those disparate job positions into one and averaging them out as a uh, meaningful comparison. Yeah, I think. Um... I think it's a meaningful comparison because uh, you know a worker who um, is qualified, uh, and they're looking at you know a, a job posting for state uh, for a state job versus a um, a private sector job. Chances are the you know even with the wages alone, chances are that that um, you know the state uh, the state job is going to pay higher wages um, on top of you know whatever benefits are being offered. So I'd highlight for you code number two, 92, which is public administration, uh, which includes you know, public safety employees. How, how do you make a meaningful com uh, comparison to a, a job group like that to an average of private sector employment that is so meaningfully different in, it, in how you carry out the job and the risks associated with that position? Yeah, I think so. I think that you know we can get into details like that. I'm happy to answer individual individual questions like that. I think that um, I think that it's like I said in the beginning, it's very difficult to compare 
um, individual job roles from the private sector to public sector, which is why we're looking at averages and medians, because that gets at what is the collective experience of this group of employees versus the collective experience of this group of employees. So that's the that's the comparison we're trying to make. Um, you know, and and individual job titles and individual job roles are difficult to compare, even within the private sector. You know, a, a title, a job title in one company does not necessarily translate to the same exact job in another company. So even within the private sector, it's difficult to compare, let alone trying to compare private sector job roles and titles to a public sector one on an individual level. Um, so those, you know, those types of comparisons are are tricky and difficult to do. Um, which is why we're looking at averages and medians. I'm sorry, I'm just making a, an, an analogy right now in my head that it, that doesn't work for me, what you just said. I'm thinking about another task the legislature is taking on right now, which is student waiting studies. And we're looking exactly at how you have to pull apart those averages to understand the what's actually going on in a situation. So for example, you could say students in, you know, Burlington have much higher amounts of money needed to support each student. And you could compare that to somewhere else in the state where it's very different. But when you pull those numbers apart and look at the details, you see that there are many more students who are English language learners in the Burlington area, and therefore the needs are required. And so I, I don't actually agree with you that the averages give us the better data. Just stating that for the record. Yeah, so I think that you could do an in-depth analysis of this. That's a, you know, to look individually at job levels. It's, I'm not saying it's, you shouldn't do it. I'm saying it's difficult to do and, um, and, uh, you know, if you don't do it well, it doesn't give you meaningful data. And so that was that was beyond what we were able to do in this report to to be able to dig into individual job roles and compare them was was a larger scope than um, than we could take on in this particular report. That is something that the state probably should look into. This is something that I would encourage. Uh, you know, the state to look at how competitive are individual job roles within state government compared to the private sector. Um, but what we're trying to do is kind of give you an all overall picture of what is the collective experience of our private sector employees versus the overall collective experience of our, our public sector ones. Well, sorry, this is been a lot. Um, I think one of the issues with what you just said is giving an overall experience what we're telling we're saying you can't give an overall experience of public sector versus private sector when you don't break down education experience, et cetera. This is sort of like, because it even says in your report, the verdict. We say, we're saying that the Vermont annual earnings from 2019 are stating this for Vermont state employees versus the private sector. It is literally comparing the apples to oranges. I hate using that analogy, by the way, but I'm going to use it because this is giving, you know, the title of your report, the public sector myth. That's basically saying we already have all the facts. You don't have all the facts. You haven't parsed out all the data on the different types of jobs in private sector and public sector. So I feel like this part of the, your report, if that's what you want to call it, is very, very, very easy. And I just want to put that out there. You don't break down the different jobs. What I do in the education I had to obtain is completely different from whichever average of the private sector you are comparing my job to. And that's for everyone who works a, pro a public sector job. No, and by the way, I'm not putting down anyone who works at a fast food restaurant, but that's a different education level and experience level than a public employee who has to go through a rigorous hiring process and has to have a level of experience before they can have that job. So I'm just putting that out there, that that is a highly valuable part of this report. Yeah, I, you know, there's there's going to be individual comparisons that, you know, don't make sense, you know, and comparing a state employee to a, uh, you know, to someone working at McDonald's, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily make sense because for a number of reasons, um, but not all private sector employees work at McDonald's. Um, so and, and also not all, you know, public sector employees are executives. So, you know, again, there's a range of experiences within that 
you know, what in within that average. Um, all right, so I there was a question earlier on um, comparing uh, comparing individual job roles, uh, and we were able we did do that with teachers because teachers in particular have a higher um, education level. Um, so two things that we did here is we looked at um, at two three things really. We looked at what the uh, hourly wages and benefits for teachers are. We compared that to, um, and teachers specifically that worked for um, for uh, public employers, the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't break this out for um, for uh, private teachers, private school teachers. So, um, but they do report all teachers, which includes both the public and private employers. So we included those numbers here uh, to show that um, you know the ones in red are the ones that are. Uh, just um, public school teachers uh, employed by public school and then um, and then green is all teachers. Um, we can see that when you include the private school teachers in that in those numbers it, it draws the average down, um, which would indicate that uh, private school teachers are paid less than our public schools. Um, how much less we don't really know. Um, we just know that, when we include them in the numbers, it pulls the average down. And that's true for both wages and salaries. Um, so we kind of, we stacked those in the bar chart here um, to, to illustrate uh, where some of those differences are. Um, it's not a huge difference, but again, we also have uh, our, we, uh, we have a lot more public school teachers than we do private school teachers. So, um, you know, so there's some information that can be gained from that. Uh, we also compared, uh, we compared uh, teachers to uh, to nurses because um, you know nurses uh, have a similar level of education requirements, um, you know ongoing certifications and things like that, similar to what teachers have. Um, and you can see even uh, even with nurses, um, they're still uh, teachers are still making about seven dollars more an hour. Um, although the benefits are fairly fairly decent for um, for nurses, healthcare tends to pay better benefits. Um, than most of the private sector. Uh, so those are somewhat comparable with what, um, with what teachers are seeing. So any, um, any questions on this particular chart? Could, could I yeah, jump please. back to the previous slide? Could I just jump back to the Absolutely. previous slide? Thank you. Ben, before we left the, uh, the idea that um, averaging uh, and medians are, are a meaningful comparison, I wanted to highlight that accommodation and food services um, are, and uh, retail trade are the second and third largest uh, sources of private sector employment. They also happen to be lower uh, wage uh, fields of employment and there is no uh, government equivalent. So the, I, I, I have to challenge the notion that drawing anything from the average or median is is really meaningful in any way. Okay, thank you. Uh, That's Kate. Yeah. Oh, all right. Did you want to respond? And then Kate has a question. Sure. Yeah. I, you know. Um, so food service. Uh, food service um, certainly is. But I mean, you look at uh, you know things like construction and road uh, and um, you know road maintenance and things like that. Um, you know, which are fairly low wage jobs in the private in the public sector then you know there may not be a perfect comparison to um you know to the public sector in those in those types of roles things like plowing for example um you know maybe they're not really a perfect comparison uh from from the private sector to the public sector so you know there that can sort of go both ways but um you know to your point yeah food service there, there is some limited employment for food service um, in state government, but it mostly it's contracted out. I mean, if you look at, at NISCS code 72 and 44 to 45, uh, there, is, there is no comparison. Um, it's not whether there's a perfect comparison or not. There just simply is nothing to compare to. And yeah. And are two of the largest sources of data that you're utilizing in your analysis. Yeah, and we looked at a number of those that are compared, that are, you know, um, there's maybe a dozen or, uh, or so of those NCS codes that are 
that are comparable or there are comparable, um, you know, direct comparisons between public and private sector. And um, most of them are, uh, are right in line with each other. So we did look at that. Uh, and the ones that are directly comparable, there wasn't a huge difference um, that we found between uh, the comparable ones and the, that were in the data set. So um, I think that bears further investigation. Um, and that's something we would like to look at in what a, probably a phase two of this report. Kate, did you have a question? Yeah, um, your report compares two female dominated professions, nursing and teachers. And there have been years of studies on the issue of gender inequality. Um, isn't it true that these reports conclusively found that females suffer from a gender pay gap such that men with similar degrees make more than women? Um, that's certainly true nationally. Uh, something we did look at in some of the data that's available from DOL is um, the wage gap between men and women, and they do break it down in some industry level, not at the job role level that we see on this particular chart. Um, but Vermont has actually uh, done some great work in this area where we're, our, our pay gap is less than, significantly less than the national average, um, you know, and, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty competitive um, when it when it comes to that, like we're so there is that is a factor certainly, but um, but it's probably less of a factor in Vermont than it is in other states. Isn't it true that by cherry picking two female dominated professions, you're highlighting the pay inequity between men and women, and hiding the fact that men make more than women merely because of gender? Um, I think we we were trying to do is compare two professional. Uh, professional occupations that have similar education requirements. Um, I'm just, most teachers are far more educated than nurses. And so I'm wondering, shouldn't you have compared them to other highly educated male dominated professions like engineers, lawyers, or doctors? The information that I have in front of me says that about 95% of um, secondary teachers, which I, I am a secondary teacher, may uh, have a bachelor's degree or more. And then as far as registered nurses, we're looking at maybe maybe 65% compared to 95%. Um, so we're, if we're specifically looking at new hires, um, pretty much all hospitals require bachelor degrees. Now the ones that don't, um, the nurses that don't have a bachelor's degree uh, um, likely have been practicing for a number of years. Um, and, uh, but they're really, hospitals are not hiring people at this point that don't have a bachelor's degree. Okay, even still we've, uh, in, in secondary school teaching, that's where, where I am. We have 56% have a master's degree or higher. And as far as the registered nurses data that I have, we're looking at about 12%. Yeah, I, if you can send me those numbers, that'd be great. I'd be happy to look at those. Um, I don't think comparing teachers to doctors is necessarily a good a good comparison. Doctors usually have eight years um, of of education. Um, you know, not that teachers don't. Uh, some of them, some post secondary teachers certainly do, but um, but that's not a great perfect comparison either. So. I'm going to um, remind us that we have about 15 minutes left to get through this report. Um, sure. Our, so just a, just a reminder that because we have all of our actuarial work to do after this and that's pretty heavy plowing, so. Perfect, well, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up here. So um, I think, you know, uh, what, you know, some of the some of the high points that um, Pat touched on in the beginning, um, you know, there when you're again looking at averages, uh, you know, um, private sector is about twelve thousand dollars less per year than the public sector. Um, the public sector is top twenty five percent of income earners; they're in the top quarter, um, and uh, they've also seen. Uh, more sustained high wage growth over the past two decades, um, grown faster than the underlying economy and faster than um, private employ employment wages. And where we, you know, where we come out of this, I think we don't have um, necessarily specific recommendations about how you, 
how you solve this, you know, how you address this from a pension perspective. Um, I think the main takeaway for, for us is that, um, you know, where it comes down to, uh, you know, benefits and how benefits factor into the, um, the uh, competitiveness of our, of our um, private sector or public sector workforce. Um, you know, we're, we're already seem to be pretty competitive on wages. Uh, and what that may mean for, um, for the pension discussion is that uh, those benefits that we offer uh, that are two or three times what the private sector offers may not be as necessary as, uh, as we thought it was. Um, I think that's the main takeaway here because wages are actually more competitive than, um, than we might've thought previously. So that's, I think the, the big takeaway we have. A couple of points that I wanna reiterate even, um, you know, to, to what our recommendations around pensions have been is we need to keep our promises to, to existing state employees. Um, you know, uh, they, uh, we made those promises, we need to keep them. Um, and also, uh, another concern is that this is going to get worse before it gets better. Pat mentioned that we have 20% of our, uh, of our state workforce that is eligible to retire now or within five years. That's a large, um, that is a large, uh, percentage. We've already seen this sort of happening with teachers over the past, uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, we've had a lot of retirements for, uh, for teachers. And, um, and we're likely to see a lot of retirements in our state employees as well. So this is going to drive, um, you know, drive some of those pension costs that we've been talking, you know, that, that everyone has been talking about. Um, that's concerning. So we've got to figure this out. Uh, and I really appreciate all the work that um, this, this task force is doing. It's important work. Um, and we need to, uh, we need to get these, um, these pension plans and their healthcare plans back on uh, sustainable footing so that uh, we don't risk the, the future retirement promises that we've made to these um, state employees. So I think that's the overall takeaway. And, um, you know, I would, we would encourage the committee to look at, uh, you know, what benefits are necessary for new hires specifically uh, to, to see what we can do there. Um, because, uh, you know, what I think this data is suggesting is that wages are already pretty competitive um, and so we, we don't necessarily need to be as afraid of touching benefits for new hires as we might have been um, previously. So any, uh, any questions on that? Yes. Um, so to, to address the nature that uh, Leona had, had brought up of, of this kind of apples and oranges comparison, are, are you familiar with um, an article that Phil Kessling wrote um, entitled what a public employee really costs. Um, no, I'm not familiar with that article. Okay. Well, Mr. Kelsing points out that the study and this is, this is in reference to the BLS study that, um, that, that your report relies on. Uh, the study simply calculates the average cost of wages and benefits for all private sector workers then compares them to all state and local government workers. It's a bit like comparing the Green Bay Packers to the San Antonio Spurs and exclaiming Spurs on average are 45% taller. They're different games and different worlds. After all, government has virtually no minimum wage fast food workers and the private sector is pretty light on firefighters and K, and 12, K through 12 teachers. I'd also like to highlight a report that the National <laughs> Institute of Retirement Security um, authored entitled Out of Balance, Comparing Public and Private, private Sector Compensation Over 20 Years. Um, I, I would like that to be uh, the committee to enter that into the record as well to be uh, provide both aspects of, of the view here. Um, I, have a, I have a question getting to uh, compensation maybe not needing to be where it is. Uh, there's quite a lot of vacancies in state government at the moment. Um, if compensation was um, as rich as you suggest, why do you think that? Why do you think that exists? So this is 
there's an analogy to this that I just saw recently. Um, that's interesting. You know, so yes, there's a lot of vacancies in, in state government. Um, there's a lot of vacancies in, uh, in the private sector as well. Um, you know, many businesses are struggling to find employees uh, across all different salary bands. And, um, you know, uh, one, of the, one example of this, I just saw, there was an article this week, um, I think it was in Digger, on uh, um, superintendents that were having a hard time um, hiring teachers. And the um, analogy was that, uh, you know, they used to have two or 300 applications for a teacher opening in Burlington. Um, and this year they've only got, whenever they have a teacher opening, they've gotten like 50 applications. Um, and uh, talking with, with private businesses, uh, they would love to get 50 applications. Often they get zero or, you know, or, or a half dozen applications for an open position. Um, so, so this is a, an experience that, that, Every, all employers are facing right now. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, um, I think that the state is still more competitive than most private sector businesses when it comes to hiring. Just thinking about the analogy and the point in Burlington, which is one of the higher paid districts in the state um, and considering that significant drop in applicants there, um, I work in Waterbury and 10 years ago when I applied for my kindergarten teaching job, we had over 200 applicants for multiple two positions. This past spring, we had two open positions. We had five applicants. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I'm hearing a lot of those, a lot of that same, I mean, private sector has never gotten 200 applicants unless, unless it's a really highly competitive business, but um, but I'm hearing a lot of the same things from from private sector businesses about, you know, getting a half dozen people that apply even to jobs that a few years ago would have gotten um, 10 times that. So. Right. But we're talking about public sector and teachers, not private sector. We're trying to focus that conversation. Um, yeah, Molly. I, think I was just going to echo, Andrew. I noticed that none of your data about um, teacher salaries and things are from south of nine i work down in the southeast corner of the state we've had zero applicants for some open positions and um you know it's just it's been really challenging 50 is by no means any kind of average right now for yeah Abs absolutely yeah um that's you know burlington would be considered highly competitive in that in that space um so my point is though that the the workforce problems are broader than just um, our, our public employees, they're being felt in, in both the private and the public sector, um, was, uh, was my point there. Any other comments or observations? Oops, Sorry. that's okay. I you know, in, in my committee, you would be required to take us all to Sarducci's <laughs> Sarducci's, yes, and, and our, our our spouses or dates or whoever. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. But, Mr. My, uh, oh. Oh. Mr. Kingsley, if if I understand correctly, you're you're relying on the average and the median to draw these comparisons. Um, do you adjust for education, training, and experience in any way? Um, we we looked at that for teachers. Yeah. Um, and we did look at it for uh, a little bit for um, uh, state employees as well. Uh, and again, that those comparisons are really difficult to make because often uh, there is no equivalent position between the public and private sector. Any, any other comments or wrap up? So, Thank you very much um, for doing this and coming and presenting it to us. Do you have any final words for us or um, thoughts or observations? I think, I, I think the only thing um, what I would leave you with is uh, that, um, A, we really appreciate the, the work that you're doing. This is not easy. These are not easy conversations to have. Um, I think our recommendation, given uh, this data, is to look at um, 
um, at the benefit plans for new hires as much as possible uh, and um, and trying to, to keep the promises we made to existing employees. I think that that's our main uh, recommendation given this data. Um, Pat, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I agree with you totally, Ben. You really summarized it really well. The committee's um, primary focus is to safeguard the long-term stability of our pension funds. We're hoping that this information will, will help you make those decisions on the pension side. Um, salaries are another discussion altogether as far as individually, but collectively, um, we have to look at the pension funds and, and keep our promises. So thank you very much for this opportunity. and. We'll be back to you with phase two. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we'll be done with our work before phase two hits us. <laughs> we, will. we will. But I think this, this is going to be an issue that's going to be discussed um, for a while. It is indeed. But I think this task force hopes to be done before phase two. Hits us. So, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You're welcome to stay. So yes, we, have, we have on our agenda now a 15 minute break. Can so I ask one question yeah. before we break? Sure. Um, I just noticed on the agenda in the afternoon that there's a, a time for small breakout groups. And I have two questions about that. I don't really remember the agenda setting, but when I thought about the breakout groups, uh, I remembered the first time we did it when the public couldn't hear yeah. and we got a lot of feedback about that, which concerns me. And I also remember coming back to this group and a number of us felt like expressed and felt like, oh, that's a good idea. I wish we had thought of that and we didn't have time at that point to process. And I'm wondering if the group as a whole might reconsider that idea of small breakout groups and instead stay together for those discussions. So um, what we've done is we have, um, we've found three rooms where we can have three separate zooms and streams so it will be open and accessible to the public they'll be able to tune in and watch and you know may not be a camera on each individual but the audio from the room should come through just fine and you'll notice that there is time in the agenda this afternoon for us to share our design scenarios yeah, um, so that we can come back and uh and share those ideas if one group sees something that another group did um you know, you can certainly share those. I think, uh, I don't know about you, but I also talk with other members of the task force during lunchtime too. So if there are things that you see in the actuarial analysis that you think uh, you'd like to learn more about, you know, perhaps you can have a, a lunchtime chat as well. Yeah, I, I'm happy to hear about the multiple technological solutions. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just wondering how others feel about the small group versus large group. Uh, and I appreciate having some time to come back. I remember last time we did share, but it was in that sharing where we were like, oh, I wish we had had time to chew on that. And it's the chewing on it. You know, I'm often inspired by the thinking of others around the circle. I don't know how others feel about that. Um, I, we can hear how others feel about it. I think that because they're the, the, um, the results the of the, the first round are are so starkly different from yeah. the different groups that the conversation will be very different in in the different breakout groups and the, and there are is, different concerns right so I, I think that having trying to deal with all everything in the large group is i've thought a lot about this and because i was on your thought wave there for a long time but i think that when we hear when we hear the the report from the actuarials, actuaries, I think that um, we will see that there probably is a need for some breakout sessions, whether it's that long or not, I don't, I don't know, but um, I, I think that we'll find, we'll hear that this, when Chris gives us, walks us through those. And I'd love to check in with you at the break, maybe you can help me understand your change yep. of mind. Yep. <laughs> And yeah. um, I just again, um, I, I agree. I agree with Molly. I, I think at this point, it, it it does make sense as as a group maybe to look at each um, each thing individually. Uh, maybe it makes sense to let's just say an hour on 
group effort and our on, on the teachers and our on, on group C. But at, at the very least, uh, I, I would I would request, and I, I think it only makes sense at this point in time, that I, uh, whether if it's John and I again, that, that we join with Eric and, and, and uh, Leona because they do have members that are part of group C. And I think we are getting to a point where uh, it, it wouldn't be, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, just for for just one of you know just the, the troopers associations being make making decisions for uh, VSEA members. Uh, so at, at the very least, I would make that request that we we at least join them or have some time to sit down with them and and go through all of that together. And I think I think that happened last time too because I think that you finished up rather quickly and then joined. We them. did, but we didn't have. A, in my opinion, we didn't really have a good chance to yeah. sit down with Eric. And, and but now I wanted to say, okay, yeah. what are you guys thinking about this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Good. I think that's a good suggestion.